We're not going to use a mic tonight, so if at any point we start to chat a little low, just raise your hand in the back if you're having trouble hearing us. Um, my name is Victoria Gordon, and I'm the acting director of the Athena Center for Leadership Studies here at Barnard. And I'm delighted to see so many familiar faces in the crowd. We have some students, we have friends of the center, alums, um, just members of the public. Um, and that's what we aim for and what we shoot for at these Power Talks. Um, the Power Talks are our speaker series. So we bring distinguished women leaders from diverse fields and sectors here to Barnard to share their insights and their stories um, with all of you. So I hope you enjoy. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to call out a couple of upcoming events that we have on the horizon. Um, so for those of you who might not be aware, uh, we have the Athena Film Festival coming up next week. So opening night is a week from Thursday. Um, thank you. Um, so the Athena Film Festival is our contribution to really shifting the cultural conversation around what leadership looks like. So all of the films feature a strong female protagonist at the center of the story. We have features, docs, shorts, virtual reality, a works in progress documentary showcase, um, and there are a bunch of free screenings and also free educational workshops and panels for filmmakers. Um, so I encourage you to check out the lineup. It's athenafilmfestival.com. And uh, opening night, as I said, is on Thursday, but films run throughout the weekend, so through Sunday, March 3rd. Um, we also have another Power Talk coming up. It'll be our last of the semester with Anna Holmes, and that is on April 3rd. Um, so again, similar to this, it's free, open to the public. The registration link is on our website. Please share with friends and family. Um, just a little bit about how we're gonna run the show this evening. Um, Farai and I are gonna be in conversation. I have a couple of questions that I've prepared based on our conversation. Um, so I'll ask you know four or five questions, and then we're really gonna turn it over to you and open it up. There's a small enough group here that we can have have a really nice and intimate conversation. Um, and I feel like some of you might have better questions than I do in terms of what you want to hear for I focus on. Um, so we'll be turning it over to you pretty, pretty soon in the program. Um, so with that, I'm going to sit down and introduce our speaker. So Farai, um, I'm sure all of you read her bio on the website, but she is a prolific author, she is a journalist, and she is now working at the Ford Foundation in their Creativity and Free Expression program, mm -hmm. which is actually a pretty badass title, I would have to say. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it is, it's fun. I think, I think that's maybe where, where, where we will start. Is yeah, that's great. You can just talk to us a little bit about the work that you're doing at the Ford Foundation, mm -hmm. specifically around gender in the newsroom. Yeah, so I have been a journalist for nearly 30 years and I didn't anticipate leaving the newsroom. I always thought it would be good to just have one foot in one world and one foot in the other. Um, so for a while I was a visiting professor at NYU teaching audio journalism and other things including journalism about race relations, um, uh, political journalism, all these things that touched on different areas of experience for me, and also working in a newsroom. So during part of the 2016 election cycle, I was teaching at NYU and covering politics for 538. Um, because of the election being what it was, I ended up working full time at 538. But the long story short is that I was offered this job or recruited heavily for the job at the Ford Foundation, and I was ambivalent. Of, oops. Oh well, yeah. Keep going. <laughs> a little, a little AC fail there for the <laughs> off camera. Um, but I was, I wasn't that interested at first because I knew that it, this was not a job where I would get to be a creator directly. And I had really spent a lot of my career strategizing to be a creator and turning down some obvious opportunities to go in a more management track direction, which is basically what you do as you get older, whether or not you want to manage, you're sort of asked to manage. And I just I navigated really hard not to go on the management track and to stay in a track where I could do reporting and um, writing and broadcasting. But this job gave me a chance to look very structurally at journalism. And so I describe it as like when you're a journalist, you're like a bricklayer or a home builder. You do something that is concrete, you can see the quality of your work, so can other people, and you can say, I did this. Whereas when you're a journalism program officer, you're like an urban planner. You're like, I want a lake over here, I want a park over here, I want a school here and a school here, but you don't build any of it. It may not turn out the way you want, it may turn out better, it may turn out worse, it may not happen at all. <laughs> so so it, it's interesting that I'm really enjoying this role. It has its frustrations, but I get to look at journalism as a whole ecosystem. Right. And part of that ecosystem, of course, is gender. And as someone who is African-American and 
uh, a woman and also have all these other attributes, where I grew up, where I went to school, you know, things I do, things I like that, that influence both um, how I see the field of journalism but also how people see me. I often was put in a position where I was overtly dealing with race issues a lot more than gender issues. Because there's this very complicated set of dynamics inside many workplaces, including journalistic ones, where it's like, people of color, you handle the people of color stuff, white women handle the women's stuff. And that can lead to all sorts of, I mean, it was for me kind of a triage for much of my career. I was like, I can't do both the women's stuff and the black people stuff. Like, I'm just gonna focus on the black people stuff. But also there was not a lot of deliberate intersectionality and I've had some tough conversations with people in newsrooms. You know, just today I actually had an interesting conversation with um, a journalism organization for people of color that has been asked to help diversify these women and media task forces, but doesn't really get power from it. So it's like, we're gonna lend you our good name and our brown bodies so that you don't look so exclusionary, but you won't share power. And these are the kinds of things that I get to hear as a grant maker, but they're also things I've seen in the newsroom. So that's a long wind up to say that what I'm really trying to do with the gender-based work at the Ford Foundation is to fund women creators, but also to help create healthier newsrooms. Um, and that's, that health is something that has to transcend race and gender, meaning both men and women have to get on a certain page it's like, you can't leave gender stuff up to women. Right. You know, it's like I'm using gender stuff, very scientific term. But it's like the reason things don't change or it's like if you are expecting women who traditionally have less power in major institutions than men to do the heavy lifting to reform a system which then is hostile to their demands, it can happen, but it's gonna be messy and it's probably gonna be a series of incomplete passes. So one of the things that I'm working on at Ford right now is setting up a conference for October on de-gender biasing the newsroom. And this is going to be for high-level newsroom managers from a variety of institutions. And it's based on work by Iris Bonet, who is a professor at the Women, he's, she's a professor and now a dean at the Harvard Kennedy School. She mm -hmm. started something called the Women in Public Policy Program. And so she did a conference on de-gender biasing the tech industry that really showed me a lot of how she thinks, which is she basically says, this is a system problem and it's a design problem. Yes, there's people who are individual bad actors or maybe herds of bad actors, but if you design a system that is more bias proof, then those people who want the worst can do the least harm. So she really works on helping us understand why certain things just don't work. Like, you know, this, um, a lot of the bias training that happens around gender in newsrooms or in other areas actually ends up harming women because there, it's been shown that some forms of bias training that ask individual workers to participate on a mandatory basis actually seem to incite men who are aggrieved to retaliate against women. The best way seems to be either having opt-in training, where basically you're seen as, as the ass if you don't participate. Right. So when it's mandatory, it's easy to say, well, they just made me do it. But when it's voluntary and nine-tenths of the people go, are you really gonna be the one-tenth of pe people who doesn't go? Right. And so it's, uh, it's an odd psychology, but making it opt-in is actually better than having it be mandatory. And the real mandatory level has to be at the manager level. Right. You know, newsroom managers, et cetera, have to be told, this is your job. If this happens on your watch, you're going to be held accountable. And so putting the onus on the managers is much more effective than asking individuals to learn some new coping skills and, and things like that where you can just have basic research that says this works, this doesn't work, this produces this unintended effect. Right. And a lot of people and newsrooms just don't know this. So part of it is sort of doing these broad-based, well, targeted trainings, broad-based information, but targeted at high-level people in the newsroom. And then part of it is just like, you know, really looking for women creators who are doing amazing things. So we just had this, um, we sponsored a, a 
leadership convening called 50 Women Can Change the World of Journalism. And it was a competitive process. Women applied um, from all over, for-profit newsrooms, nonprofit, people who were managers, people who were on the tech side, people who were on air, people who were independent uh, entrepreneurs. And so this really interesting group of 50 women came together to get leadership training, but also to form a cohort. How do you win in a world where things are challenging? And journalism is just challenging up, down, and sideways, gender aside. Um, although gender is never really aside, but you get what I'm saying. Journalism is in a financial decline and it's causing all these different pressures. So basically this cohort building says, okay, if we're bringing together the tech people, the broadcasters, um, the social media people, the people who are running journalism nonprofits, the people who are running journalism for profits, maybe they can help create a new world together. You know, when the world we have is crumbling, maybe these women can collaborate together. And there's a lot of evidence that um, fostering collaboration among women really has these incredible effects because women are, and I'm gonna go out on a gendered limb, but women are socialized to be collaborative in ways that most men aren't. It's just the way, I would, I would say that there's probably some nature in there, but it's, it's nurture. You know, like, you know, women are asked to collaborate, cooperate, get along. And sometimes that works well for us and sometimes it doesn't, but when you really use it in a targeted way, the Wall Street Journal, for example, has been putting together these interdisciplinary teams of female employees and they've been just doing great work with all these pro special projects. And the idea is if, you, if collaboration is a strong skill for you, why not use that as a tool to acquire and hold power? And I think it's really, to me, the end goal is to have a journalism industry that reflects shared values where we get the best journalism from women and men, people of different races. It's, it's not about exclusion, but that also means that at the management and ownership level, we just need more women, as well as in the rank and file. Right. So, and can you remind those of us in the audience that might not know the statistics as well as you do, but just in terms of how bad the representation is for, of women um, in the newsroom, women of color, people of color in the newsroom? Right, well, I mean, um, so people of color, the, the thing is, women are actually not doing badly overall. Mm. The problem is women don't do well in management positions, like the, the number of women leading major newspapers um, among the top 10 newspapers has declined to a low over the past 10 years. You think about Jill Abramson, um, you know, leaving uh, or being pushed out of the New York Times. There were a series of women managers in journalism who have been pushed out. Now, actually, one of the, the effects of the Me Too era has been that some of the Me Too men that have fallen have actually been replaced by women. Right. So like about a third of the Me Too men have been replaced by women. But it's the overall with women, this is one important distinction between race and gender, is when you look at race, the percentage of people of color in newsrooms is, you know, it's in the low 20%, um, it's depending on what industry, high teens or low 20s as compared to a third, more than a third of the US population being people of color. Mm. So you can see that there's a big gap there was with women, there are women amply in the newsroom but two thirds of the bylines in major articles go to men, two thirds of the airtime on network TV goes to men, so it's that women are not well positioned. Women are right. actually, you know, not only leading in terms of college graduation, but graduation from journalism school, right. graduate school. So women are entering the pipeline, but getting blocked at all these different stages. So I would say the first stage is more gender neutral, which is just sort of like, hazing the newbies and seeing who falls out. Yeah. And then over time you have women who are hazed out with pregnancy discrimination. Like I know women who've been fired during pregnancy. One of them is Catherine Goldstein who is now, um, she's just launched a new podcast called The Double Shift which is about being a working mother. But from a much more, a very adventurous and newsy angle. It's not just like, oh, how I feel about being a working mother. It's like, right. these are the ways in which your power is being taken from you. These are the laws that, that are gender biased. And so her whole experience kind of radicalized her as a mother in journalism. And she wrote a, an op-ed for the New York Times 
and also a cover of the Neiman Reports talking about where are all the mothers in journalism. So there's a hazing out of women during pregnancy and after um, they have a child, um, but also just in general, this whole idea of like what does a leader look like? Right. And very often women are not viewed as being leaderly enough. Right. And so, so it's really not an overall numbers problem, but like the Women's Media Center does the great stats that say right. how many men are getting <laughs> bylines and how many, uh, what percentage of airtime is coming from men. So it's like two thirds of that is going to men. Right. You know, even when there's theoretically a gender neutral workforce in most major newsrooms. Right. Yeah, they do. They publish a lot of those reports as well, just on women's representation in film, which is a lot yeah. of what we use. Um, around the film festival and one of the conversations that we're always having um, is just thinking about creators influencing yeah. cultural output, right? Yeah. So when you have men making the films, more often than not the films are about men or from the perspective of men or the women um, are not given equal representation alongside male characters. And yeah. so I'm just wondering, given the fact mm -hmm. that you are a journalist but now you're also studying the landscape of journalism right. and you're, you know, over the past few years, how have you seen this lack of representation influence how women and women's issues are portrayed in the media? Yeah. Um, and I know you, I, you know, gender and race, def different topics, but you study both. So I guess yeah. the parallel is same, same with race. If there's a representation problem, people of color in the newsroom, how, how is that impacting how those stories and how that news is covered? Well, here's a couple of examples that are pretty, uh, they're, they're a little bit further back and then I'll get closer to where we are today. So one of them is just looking at the New York Times and I think some very helpful introspection. So the New York Times realized that its obituaries had not included women. And it's gone back and started writing retroactive obituaries for women of note who should have been covered if people had been looking for women of note. But the obituary section was for men of note. Um, so there was a woman, and I, I hope I'm getting her name right, Dovey Roundtree Johnson, who I'd never heard of, who was a pioneering civil rights lawyer and a minister, and all these fascinating women, like they've been dead for a while. You know, some of them a long while, some of them a little while. But I think that that idea of doing a retroactive set of obituaries to correct the historical body of work is is important. And then I think um, in terms of race, the the uh, Times also recently published an article on how it, I mean, uh, it was a cluster of articles that talked about how the um, crack baby rhetoric was bad science, it was racially, you know, influenced. There's no, nobody talks about opioid babies or oxy babies, you know what I mean? Right. And, and there's no more evidence that those children today in the opioid crisis will have inherently more long-term effects. It will depend on how they're nurtured um, once they're detoxed and, and weaned off of drugs that have, may have been in their mother's system. The same was true for crack babies, but the whole term was a racially loaded term that was invented you know, by various, you know, it was used by a variety of people, including um, very mainstream newsrooms that thought it was just okay to use that term. Right. And now they've gone back and said, oh, you know what, we really messed up here. So I think that this idea in one example, gender and one example, race, of looking retroactively at what was missing or what was included that never should have been included. But then you get to today and you still see some real gaps in um, how people of color are included on elite political news teams. There was a big to do when CBS announced its, you know, it, you know, obviously in formation 2020 presidential race team didn't include any black people. And it was like, oh, so this is how you're gonna announce your rollout? Like, why do you think that's okay? Right. And, and I always make the case that it's not because you need to have one black person on every team just to look you know, Wakanda-esque. It's like, <laughs> like you have a bunch of stuff you need to know. Like when I right. go out in the field as a black woman, there's certain realities I face in just getting the story. Um, and the same thing is true for a white man. The same thing is true for an Asian American woman. Same thing is true for reporters I know who work in the hijab right. and go out into the field and everyone knows they're Muslim. Um, 
you get different responses and the newsroom should want all of those responses. Right. People will say things to me like I remember being <laughs> at the Republican convention in Texas and this guy told me how colored people needed to vote for Republicans because of Abraham Lincoln and I was just like, the fact that you haven't <laughs> updated your like glossary on the colored people thing <laughs> says, says a little bit <laughs> about where you're coming from. Like, so maybe you need to like refresh that before you go into Abe Lincoln, <laughs> you know? So it's like, and the thing is he wouldn't have said this, I think to a white guy, right? You know, he felt like he needed to make the case to me. And I was right. like, hey, you can make your case, but the glossary is, you know, so, I think that sending people out who have different identities reveals different truths. Right. And any newsroom that can afford to field 15 or 20 reporters during the course of an election, which is very expensive, should have a mix of people for that reason, among others. And also people have different contacts. Like for example, when I was interviewing tw Trump voters in Eastern Ohio, my best source was my friend's 80 something year old mother who's a Trump voter and she kind of gave me between my friend and her mother, they gave me a lay of the land of who I should talk to, where I should go, and that was just because this is a friend of mine from college. I would have found other routes, but it's like every person has those kind of connections, but they're right. gonna be different connections. Right. You know, like you would not have necessarily predicted that I would be connected to a Trump voter in you know, Warren, Ohio, with whom I exchanged Christmas cards, but that just <laughs> happens to be the case. And every reporter will have these different relationships that speak to their social context. And that's also important. You don't want a bunch of people the same age who went to the same college, the same gender. That produces really bad political reporting. And yet, many people still think it's okay. Well, and that's the kind of news many people are still opting into. So that's actually yeah. a really good segue. Um, we talk a lot about, I think at Barnard, about wanting to make sure we're not just operating in an echo chamber, right? Yeah. So chances are, if you go to Barnard, um, you share a similar perspective with a lot of your peers and a lot yeah. of your professors. Um, and yet, as academics, as people that want to cr think critically about issues, um, it's important for us to make sure that we're doing everything we can to chase after diverse perspectives and viewpoints. Yeah. And so just as, I mean, so one, what's your opinion on, like, what do you read? Um, can uh -huh. you give us some recommendations yeah. about if we're looking for, um, you know, if we have an appetite to consume um, media that has been fact-checked, right. um, that represents a diversity of viewpoints, yeah. um, that will give us a better holistic understanding of the landscape, you know, where should we go? Um, Let's start with that and then maybe have yeah, a Yeah, I mean, I have some very quirky media consumption patterns based on what I need. So um, I'll just describe them, but it's not necessarily what I would recommend for everyone. So I read certain digests. So I read the Columbia Journalism Review digest, which is really great at saying this is what's happening in the media. And it's mainly about the business of media, which I need to know about, but sometimes it's about certain controversies that have been covered in the media. Um, I read digest from like the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, um, but I also, to be honest, I do a lot of discovery on Twitter, but that's the way I have Twitter set up. I have my Twitter feed my follow set up so they go all the way from the far ideological left to the far ideological right. Mm -hmm. I have it set up so that I have a mix of news organizations, academics, and individuals who are just interesting. I have a bunch of international um, feeds on my Twitter. So my Twitter curation is not random. It allows me to see, you know, uh, partisan reaction. So, okay, so this has come up. I can see how these partisan outlets on the left and these partisan outlets on the right are covering it. And I get a lot of pointers, and I also get a lot of pointers from the academics who curate certain things. Certain people curate race, certain people curate stuff on Africa, certain people curate stuff on Brexit. So, you know, I've set up a discovery mechanism that works for me, and I don't just rely on Twitter. I also kind of use I have a lot of discovery through listservs. Mm -hmm. So there's one called The Bell, which is just about Russia. It's relatively new, it's a website. 
called the Bell, and then it produces a weekly listserv, like what's going on in Russia, who got arrested, who got killed. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm joking, but not really, right. you know? I mean, right. it's like some strong stuff. And it's really relevant to American politics now for us to understand the oligarchic nature of Russian politics and the very cutthroat nature of um, how the game is played legally um, for business owners, politicians, et cetera. So I'm more of someone who I, I curate a list of listservs that are rel relevant to me in one way or the other and then use those as pointers to go find information. Mm. Um, I realize that's kind of impractical for most people, so what I would say is pick a news organization you trust and then read at least occasionally two or three outlets that you think don't trust the organization you trust. Mm and see how those other voices, when do you think those other voices are telling the truth? When do you think they're not? Do you even know? Have you done enough research on your own to come up with your own perspective? If not, how would you go about finding it out? Like there's, there's a, a sort of theory right now that for some people news is about finding confirmation of what they already believe and right. for some people news is about discovering what's new without as much need for confirmation, but I can say for myself, even though I really try to avoid it, I fall into confirmation bias. Like, I'm like, oh, well, that story's gotta be true, and it's like, oh, no, that's not right. Right. You know, and you have to be willing to be a little bit humble when, you know, you find out that the narrative you thought was real is either being gamed or slanted and and it takes a lot of work it takes i won't lie it takes a lot of work but i think that's okay to read something you trust as your main thing but you also then have to seek out the opposing points of view and, right. and i do seek them out and i'm on certain listservs where i'm just like well that's kind of bs but i'm on that listserv to hear what the bs is right you know and i want to know and i but i think for some people even that first step of finding a channel or a platform they trust can be really difficult there right are, there's been a lot of polls recently that show that americans trust in the media is significantly below yes. where it has been historically um and the you know reasons behind that I think are varied, um, but I'm just wondering as a journalist, but now also that's someone that studies journalism at the meta level, is there anything journalists you know that you're thinking you can do to help restore our faith in the media? Yeah, definitely. Or else I wouldn't be doing this job. Right. I mean, one of the things I'm looking at are how do funding po pipelines operate, and how can different groups of people get into those funding pipelines. So at Ford right now, almost 65% of our grants are going to organizations headquartered in the metro areas of San Francisco, New York, DC, and Boston. And to me, that's a problem, and we're setting out to change it. And that means that there's a lot of discovery that has to go on about how we fund, well, I'm on Ford's rural initiatives team. So there's a rural strategies and initiatives team and then I'm on a couple of other teams, but one of our, our sort of overarching rubric at Ford is media equity, which says that everyone deserves to be covered, A, period, covered, B, covered well, which means not stereotyping, right. you know, not putting someone in a box, <coughs> covered consistently, and that everyone should have a chance to be a newsroom worker, manager, or owner. And so when you look at the media equity framework, that includes rural Americans who are you know, not in the newsroom enough. That includes the working class. So it's not just a race and gender thing. But I think that we have to acknowledge that, so for example, one of the things that happened was that journalism was professionalized and create, you know, it became a track that you could study in school. Right. And that pushed a lot of working class people out. A lot of the best newspaper reporters used to be people who never graduated from college, some, some of whom never graduated from high school. And now the professionalization of journalism has largely driven a lot of working class people, particularly working class white men, out of the newsroom. So to me, that's a problem. You know, it's, it's media equity is equity for everyone. Right. But also the mechanics by which certain people are included or excluded from newsrooms are different. So why working class white men are not in, you know, 
major newsrooms is different from why black people aren't, is different from why Muslim women aren't, is different from why white women aren't. Right. So I don't try to universalize just because many different groups have problems of access doesn't mean that there's equal um, re or the same reason or the same solution. So I think one of the mistakes has been like saying, well, let's just make everything better for everyone. It's like, <laughs> well, yeah, that sounds great, and I want that, but let's not try to find the solution for everyone, because that's not going to work. You know, there's very different patterns, I would say, to the way working class white men, women of color, white women, people with disabilities are all shut out of the newsroom, but by many different mechanisms. Right. That, and that have to be individually addressed in order for us to move ahead. And so I think part of it is just about having more, using my position to do the research to disaggregate the reasons and, and mechanisms we can change. Because I think we need everyone's intelligence to, I mean, the lack of trust in media is not entirely unfounded. It has been weaponized mm -hmm. in a way that I think is unhelpful. But there was a report that came out in 1947, the Hutchins Commission report, which I just found out about from uh, a vice president at Ford. And it basically said, consolidation of media is shutting out voices in a democratic society. People are feeling left behind, local news. I mean, like it's like 1947. It's like, you have no idea you know, <laughs> what's about to go down. You know? <laughs> it's like, but it's like they could see it starting right. to happen. And a lot of it is that when people's local issues are not reflected in the news and they don't feel seen, why should they trust the news industry? Right. And so I, I want to shift into, um, into talking about some of your books that you've written. But oh, I guess sure. final question on, on gender and politics, um, because I'm curious. Yeah. Um, thinking about lack of representation and this issue of um, diversity in the newsroom and also striking on something you said earlier about this perception of women and how often we're not um, necessarily perceived as being leaderly mm -hmm. so and combine that with the fact that you did so much coverage on the 2016 election so yeah. looking ahead to 2020 when so many women have announced yep. their candidacy yep. um, f to run for president can you just in you know not predicting not asking you to predict the future but just can you tell us a little bit um, about what you think we might see in terms of some of this coverage of those female candidates do we think um, we've maybe learned some lessons in thinking back about how the media covered Hillary yeah um, I hope so I mean you already at least see what you see is a little bit more introspection like there was something recently about um, I can't remember who it was, but it was about how there was news coverage of one of the women candidates, and it was very gendered, and okay, let's deconstruct this. So I think what you're gonna see is still a lot of gender-weighted coverage, but then a quicker course correction to say, actually, we messed up, and how we did this doesn't reflect how we would have covered a man. I'm not sure it will just be a straight line to, okay, we're gonna cover everyone as a human being. And also then once you get race into it, like I saw um, uh, something about Senator Harris and uh, you know a couple of different things, but a friend of mine who's South Asian pointed out, because I've been to India, specifically to Southern India, and um, her, Harris's mom was from uh, Tamil Nadu, which is a very, um, it's a place where basically people are quite dark skinned and they it's very India has many different ethnic groups but there's basically the the Aryans who came into the north who are lighter skinned there's a bunch of people who are who look east asian mm -hmm. but who are sort of in hill tribes and different parts of uh, major cities and then there are some southern indians who are quite dark skinned and are from an, a different ethnic group than the, the Aryans who came into the North. And so she was like, her mom, this is a friend of mine who's a South Asian immigrant, and she may be wrong, but I'm repeating what she said. She was like, her mom, who was an activist and from Tamil Nadu, already had an orientation as a black woman, not as a black American, but as a black woman to the extent that, you know, that is ways people identify in India. She was like, she was not someone who identified as a white South Asian. So mm -hmm. when people understand Harris and they're asking, how black are you? They should be asking, how black is her mom? Mm -hmm. 
right. like how black, you know, her mom has passed away, but like her mom's racial consciousness was set up in a country which is very different from America, but we're dark skinned people are treated differently than lighter skinned people and there's a lot of you know she was like she was like people need to open up the frame so i think it's there's things about gender but also like the, i was like oh that's so interesting i have been to tamil nadu i do understand you know like a little bit of it but like it's that's not my story to tell but i think also constantly challenging yourself to understand the different narratives that you need to know to cover the race and so i'm curious also how you know, Harris as a black woman with an immigrant parent, well, two immigrant parents, um, one Jamaican, one South Asian, how she will be treated differently than the white women right. in the race. Because there's this tendency, like I said, to sort of say, white women play the women role, and then the women of color play the of color role. But I think we may see that break down in this election, right. where at times she may be treated in ways that are more stereotypically like how you treat a woman candidate, which is generally not good. Right. It's like, you're too emotional, but you're not sympathetic enough, but you're not, it's like, but it's all these aggressive. contradictions. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You're too aggressive. You're not sympathetic enough. Oh, you cry too much. You know, it's like all of, all of the stereotypes get rolled up in a ball right. for the, the female candidate. There's nothing you can do right with your affect. Right. Basically. Right. Like if you're a female candidate, like right. you're, you're either to this or to that. Right. Um, the double bind. Yeah. The best. Yeah. And so I'm curious to see, I mean, at the very least, I hope that we can acknowledge some of the gendered frames that are usually, and, and this gets back to something we had talked about before I came here. It's like, I really feel like both in news and politics, the way that things are framed as women's issues is super problematic. So right. when you look at um, the fact that a majority of Americans across party lines support paid parental leave for both men and women after a family has a child or adopts a child. This has been gridlocked for years. And I think part of it is that it's considered a woman's issue. It's like men actually support this as well as women, but because it's a women's issue, somehow it's less headline worthy and also less worthy of political action. Right. Like no other developed country in the world, literally no other developed country in the world does not have parental leave, paid, paid mandated parental leave. And most countries, even poor ones, have a federal policy right. on paid leave, or, or not on paid leave, but on leave, sometimes paid, sometimes not. Right. So Afghanistan has um, you know, federal leave policy and America doesn't. You know, and somehow the fact that we can't really wrap our brains around this has to do with it being put in the women's issue category, as right. if men don't have kids, as if, you know what I mean? It's like, so I feel like just when things are put in the women's issues bin, they are immediately like sort of downgraded to second class attention status, whether right. that's in the media or in politics. Yeah, which is problematic for a, for several reasons. Yeah, um, I do want to shift um, slightly just in terms of topics. One of your books is entitled The Episodic Career, mm -hmm. How to Thrive in the Age of Disruption. And it provides some tips for people just in thinking about how to navigate the workforce yeah. and, and the employment search. Um, and one of the conversations we've been having here, um, especially with a lot of our seniors, is just thinking about how to navigate um, employment, uh, the, the search for employment, while also thinking about how to, how to have a meaningful career, right? And right. people have been talking a lot about work-life balance. Um, and there was that article in the New York Times recently that was talking about how employers are justifying paying people less um, by emphasizing this idea that you should love what you do. If you love what you do, we can pay you less for doing it, right? right, right. And so um, just sort of in thinking about, um, you know, we have many seniors in the room who are thinking about next steps yeah. and they want to make a difference. I mean, Barnard, this community, New York City is full of people who are change makers and want to influence real change. Um, what are some tips, you know, for, from your book or not, just from your experience? Yeah, yeah. Um, helping them think about how to frame that search. Yeah, well, before I get to the search part, when I wrote this book, I did some original survey research. And one of the interesting things I found was that, you know, people who worked for money were actually happier than people who worked for mission. 
<laughs> and at first I was like, what is, why? Why would that be? <laughs> but the thing is, if you know that you want 50,000 a year or 100,000 a year or a million a year, you know when you've hit your goal. Whereas if you want world peace, <laughs> end to climate change, end to gender bias, you're never gonna completely get there. I mean, at least I doubt it, but so, so mission-driven work is inherently frustrating and it requires a lot of self-care to keep doing mission-driven work because you're constantly faced with the failure of your ambition to fix a major thing in the world. Um, doesn't mean that you won't have many successes, but if you're ambitious about mission-driven work, almost by nature, there's an endless array of roadblocks. Right. And so I think that that really taught me, like I have a bit in the book on self-care, but I think it's important for people who are just getting ready to enter the workforce to understand that part of your job is to keep yourself healthy, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, if that's important to you, because you're always gonna face headwinds, you're always gonna face things that are not fair or forks in the road where you're gonna be asked to make moral choices. Um, and you need energy for that. You need a reserve of energy, and so you can't burn yourself out. And I, I think a problem with a lot of mission-driven organizations is because of budget, et cetera, they expect everyone to do two jobs, and they expect everyone to you know, just be on grind all the time. Like, don't you know we have to save the world? It's like, <laughs> yes, but I'm so tired, I can't even read my computer. It's right. like you have, to, you have to really decide when to push and when to do self-care. Because I've spent many a sleepless night working. I've spent a lot of time, you know, I'm not advocating like the sit on your butt strategy, but there's, there's a middle ground between sit on your butt and work until you drop. And I think that it's constantly about navigating that space. Um, but just in general, in terms of job search, I think before you get to job search, you have to really ask yourself, and, and I do have a rubric in the book, The Episodic Career, that helps you understand things like, do you want to make solo decisions? Do you want to be the decider? Or do you want to decide as part of a team? That was something I saw come up a lot. So there's a lot of places where you know, you're doing brainstorming and you know, it, it could be in any field, but it's like you're working as a team to come up with solutions, which you then implement through your work. Whereas other places, you may be doing just as much problem solving, but it's like one person comes up with the solution and everyone else's job is to implement. Right. Some people like implementing things. They don't wanna come up with, you know, the pathway. They're just happy to, you know, um, be the person who does any number of things to achieve getting down the pathway. So you have to decide, do you like being in collaborative working teams? Do you like making solo decisions? What's your appetite for financial risk? And also, just there was a really good article, and I'm forgetting where it was, but it was basically talking about the largely unspoken question of financial contributions to people's career choices and life paths. So if you're someone whose family could pay for some of your college, but you have loans, but you don't have to take care of anyone else, that's one thing. What if you're someone who did all of your paying for college, have a lot of loans, and are expected to contribute to the household where you grew up in or your right. extended family? What if you're someone where everything is paid off and someone will pay for an apartment or the down payment for an apartment? Those will then dictate different life choices and you have to be realistic. Like, if you are being asked to do a $40,000 job in a city where the average household income is $80,000, like Seattle, you know, you have to think about whether you have the ability to do that. Like, right. are you gonna sleep on someone's floor? Do you have, I mean, what, I mean, I'm not even kidding. Like, there's people literally living every kind of way, not just out of pure financial necessity, but to do the kind of work that they want to do, which also for women can raise other very complicated questions of personal safety. So there was a political strategist who was on the Dean campaign and um, a woman who had worked on that campaign accused him of attempted rape and it became a huge thing because they were all sleeping on couches on the road and this woman didn't have a door to shut right. and this guy was known as a creepy dude but she fended him off but you know first of all he didn't lose his job secondly 
you know, it took her years to tell the story. Third, he still disputes it. But, but also, like, you know, I've been in a number of unsafe situations as a reporter, but that was part of how I chose to live. Right. What's your appetite for physical risk? Um, as well as other types of risk. So these are all things you have to ask yourself before you start looking for a job. Like, these are things that may not be apparent. Like, being a reporter, you could have a desk job that's perfectly safe, except for, you know, there's also creepy dudes in newsrooms. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes creepy women. But, um, but you could have a desk job that's putatively safe, or you could have a war correspondent job, and those are both journalism jobs. Right. And so I would say that before you before you start doing the job search, ask yourself some basic questions like, you know, how much money do I need in the bank at the end of the month, you know, after I've worked? Um, am I willing to work in an industry with a high risk of layoffs or do I need an industry that's growing? If you want an industry with a high risk of layoffs, come to journalism, we need, <laughs> we need you. But, you know, if you work in tech, you've got a lower chance of being laid off. There's a lot of other problems. Right. But, you know, these are things that I just, it's, it's just practical, and it's, it's great to do mission-driven work, and I consider most of the work I've done, including what I do now, mission-driven, um, sometimes better compensated than others, but there's, you know, especially for those seeking to do mission-driven work, you have to really understand what you're getting into and what you're willing to put up with. And you should also understand that you should never be asked to put up with certain things. Right. And I think that we are now just finally, you know, wrapping our brain around not just sexual harassment and racial discrimination, but, but things like bullying, which don't even fall under any statutes. Like bullying is, according to most codes of conduct, it's not even, I mean, it may be wrong, but it's not. So you have problems where there are people in work situations who are constantly bullying other people, but because there's not an explicit statute against bullying, it's not a termination offense. Right. You know, so I heard about a workplace where the same person had been accused of bullying 22 women, but because that bullying was not explicitly forbidden, they were like, well, we just don't have cause to fire him. It's like, okay, but if 22 people have come to you and laid out the same story, right. maybe there's a problem with your HR policies. Right. How about that? <laughs> yeah, we talk a lot about the need for individual interventions, but then also addressing the, um, the policies and, yeah. and the organizational landscape as well. Whenever people come to us, to talk about leadership development and yeah. you know, we want to close the pay gap or we want to support our female employees. It's always yeah. a double-pronged approach. The but yeah, let me just, some practical tips for job hunting is that today almost everything is about networks job search. It's not about finding a listing. So the question is, who do you need to network with to position yourself to find out about the jobs before they're posted or as they're posted at the very least? You, you know, there's meetup groups, there's professional associations, there's the student chapters of professional associations. Like, you need to get out there. Like, you can't just, like, wait for a job listing, because most of the times, once a job's listed, it's already taken. There's either an inside candidate and they're posting it as a formality, or they've already had 15 people apply, like, on the side hustle before <laughs> they post the job. And so network job search is really, I mean, luckily being at a place like Barnard, you have a career services office that can help you network. But um, it's about, but there's so many ways to build networks. Like someone was telling me about one that I should join that's like, a, it's a meetup group for people in philanthropy, but they share all these tips and tools. And, you know, anyone can join an open meetup group. Right. So if you want to move into uh, fundraising, you find a fundraising meetup group. If you want to become a sports physiotherapist, you know, all these different things. It's like you have to get out there, I think, a bit if you're very focused. And if you're not focused, I would definitely talk to career services and just say, you know, how do I go about looking? And for um, some people that I know that might be interested in journalism in the audience, um, mm -hmm. any pitfalls or things, um, you know, particular tips for women who are interested in entering that field? I mean, I think that the, I think the thing is that there's a lot of really interesting internship programs that are worth exploring that do take undergrads and recent grads. So the the Nation magazine has an internship program. Most of the 
you know, uh, you know, like the public broadcasting entities, NPR, WNYC, whatever. So those internships are good as a way to sort of get to know, not just to get a foot in the door, but also to say, is this a place where I would ever want to work? Right. You know, that's that's useful. Um, but you know, again, it's such a volatile time in the industry. I think that it's about networking and finding people who can help give you a little bit of guidance. You know, and um, you know, it really is a time where the newsroom needs a lot of work. There's not a lot of money coming in, but there are always new people hired. There's always opportunity. And there's also opportunities to do your own thing. Like mm -hmm. once you've spent a few years in journalism, it's totally viable for you to say, well, I'm gonna start my own podcast or I'm gonna you know, start a magazine. You just have to figure out what your appetite is for the financial uncertainty of a new venture. Because I do see a lot of women I know, you know, relatively young women in journalism just doing their own thing. Because they're like, well, everything's broken, so if it is, let me just do my thing and see how it goes. But usually there's a series of intermittent side hustles where you're like, I'm working this job and starting this thing. But I would also encourage people to look at entrepreneurship as a way. Not, I personally don't say go with entrepreneurship first, I say, go learn some lessons in some newsrooms, et cetera. But if the entrepreneurial path also calls you, I think that's exciting. That's great. Thank you so much. I think with that, we'll maybe take some yeah. questions from the audience. Um, so if anybody has any questions, raise your hand. Yes, right up front. Hi. Um, this was really fun and interesting. I had a lot of ideas to share with my sister, who's working right now. Oh, good. Um, Yes. Making that mandatory and having the staff members um, have opt in. Mm -hmm. what, are, what sort of reactions are you getting from those trainings that are mandatory for management? Like, because I'm thinking it's like the older white men. Mm -hmm. And how, what is, who are the trainers? What are some of the reactions that you're? Well, we haven't done. Know well, we haven't done the training that I'm working on yet. Oh, okay. um, I have a lot of entities that I fund that do these types of training. So I do have, and I've sat in on some, but like, so the, the one specific one I was talking about is one that Ford is doing with a whole group of newsroom leaders. In general, these types of trainings are done newsroom to newsroom. So it would be all of the staff of this or all of the staff of that. And so the trainings definitely are, I'm trying to think of how to say this. There has to be a lot of room for people to like really absorb a lot. So I think of it as sort of a diving bell thing. Like you have to like go into the depths bit by bit. You don't want to drop straight down or people will just be like, you know, having the bends. But you have to like really what I hear in a lot of these trainings is a lot of relational work where people sort of establish their bona fides as a trainer, but also they're human bona fides. So one of the people um, who does great training is this guy, Martin Reynolds, who's with the Maynard Journalism Institute, and they do training in a lot of newsrooms. And he's someone who is a black man, but he was raised, he was adopted into a Jewish, a white Jewish family. And he talks about how people's perceptions of who he probably is as a black man are shaped by their assumption that he had black parents and that he grew up in a certain way, which you know people make all sorts of assumptions, but how his frame actually is very much as a black man, but as someone from this you know, predominantly white Jewish family and how that gives him a lot of room to really understand where people come from and to not always assume that they are what he sees on the surface. And that kind of example then builds a little room for exploration. So it's constantly about these trainings that I think are successful are ones where you get into that interpersonal space, but then you bring in the tactical stuff. Like one of the things I keep telling, for example, our journalism grantees is if they want to do hiring of a diverse staff, they have to stop asking every person of color they know to do their recruiting after they post. 
I'm like, I can't find you an employee now that you've posted this. I don't know that I could have anyway, but like you can't just be reactive. Like, have you done any work to cultivate relationships with reporters of color or female reporters right. who actually fit the job specs that you want? If you don't do that in advance, you're gonna post a job, you're gonna get a bunch of resumes from people who you already know, and then you're gonna get a bunch from people you don't know, and you'll be like, I don't know how to vouch for them. It's like, spend some time actually getting to know a diverse cohort of people who could work with you, and then once you send your blast out, you'll have a much better yield. So just talking about simple things like that, it's like, it's not you know, that you mean to be discriminatory when you just post a job, but if you haven't done that work to really you know, cultivate relationships, you're not really doing your job in recruiting. So some of it is like this very interpersonal stuff, but then some of it is like the tactical stuff of how do you do purposeful hiring that's inclusive? How do you, um, how do you deal with conflict in a newsroom? Like one of my whole theories about why newsrooms lack both race and gender diversity is that people don't know how to adjudicate the conflicts. Mm. Like when you look at management consulting research, diverse companies have a higher yield, you know, ones that have a gender diverse leadership or a racially diverse leadership or both, have a higher yield than other companies, but they also have more conflict. Mm. So in order to get these returns, you have to be willing to have tough discussions and it's because not everyone's coming from the same place which can be a huge strength right and people challenge each other's assumptions so so i would say that we haven't done the training i i'm planning to do but having watched a bunch of these it's about building trust building some interpersonal relationship connections and giving like very firm tools about this is how you can make what you do better is that um, is that financial incentive or it's just if you don't are the companies um than just saying this is a commitment at an organizational level, this is, we just want to be able to say that we claim that we are doing these things, or are managers getting, is there a financial motive for them to There's, commit to it? That's actually a really interesting one. So some companies are literally paying managers for their the yield on their diversity of hiring. Mm -hmm. Most don't. Right. And so it's that, that I would say is a rare strategy, but I think it's more about, um, like every company has its own way of prioritizing what they think is important. And of course, some are just doing lip service. Right. But I think that there are a lot of ones that actually do prioritize it, but it's not usually through a financial incentive. It's more like, you know, but it's like an evaluation. Managers will get evaluated on how good they've been at hiring. And also for nonprofit news organizations, you know, um, journalism funders do look at, you know, who's your management, who's your staff. So there becomes a different set of financial incentives to get things right. And Thomson Reuters, just as an example, outside of journalism, has been doing some really interesting things in terms of um, reverse mentor mentorship. So again, trying to give people a different frame, yeah, a different perspective. Exactly. Um, they're pairing senior managers with uh, more junior employees who are different across a variety of identities, right? So they did one on gender, so senior male managers with younger female employees. They did one across race. Um, they did one just on technology, that you know younger yeah. employees are more tech savvy and older managers aren't. So in thinking about um, their workflow and operational efficiency and yeah. obviously leveraging technology as part of that, this reverse mentorship was really important. And um, they're still publishing their reports, but it shows just making a personal connection. Um, if a male manager had been unlikely to intervene when he saw something discriminatory happening in the workplace, sort of at the outset, after the mentorship, after mm -hmm. being paired with a younger female employee, they report saying, oh, when I saw that happening, I thought of Jenny and I said something. And so um, I think there are some, some interventions that different companies are playing around with. Um, in terms of how they can get the buy-in from employees once the leadership owns it as a, as a you know, priority for the company. Yeah, and that's always the key. Does the leadership own it? And you, know, you, you don't know until, until the rubber hits the road. Yeah. And there are always overt ways that you, know, you can see when you find that lip service, it is lip service or right. is a real commitment? Yeah, there's a great example, though, that comes out of the BBC on gender where a male television host named Ross Atkins 
decided that there were too few women appearing on the air of the, the show that he hosted um, as experts. And he started asking his producers to tag all of their experts by gender. And he started a 50-50 project to get, their, to get gender balance among their experts. And then it spread to the whole company, and now some other companies are starting to do it, where they're like tagging all of their guests and asking that every show reach a gender parity on experts. And one of the things that he found was that you have to coach some of, the, so if you have a woman who's brilliant about something, but she's never been asked to do TV, right. she may not hit the ball out of the park the first time. And so it's also been about booking women who aren't great a second time and coaching them like, okay, when you were super nervous, you did this, you did that. Because it takes a lot to, I mean, I used to do TV punditry and you have to learn how it works. And so also not saying, well, that woman just wasn't very good. Like giving her a second chance and giving her coaching. So there are things like that where I think men really step up and say, I see a problem with gender and I'm gonna fix it. And we also need more of that. And same thing with, um, you know, I actually got my start in journalism because a white man said, we don't have enough minorities on staff and I'm gonna start a minority internship program. And he didn't do it because anyone told him to, he just did it because he wanted to. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Um, I've been in sports journalism ever since. Oh, that's school, great. Um, and I've been one of the only women all the way throughout in any experience that I've had. And I still remember the first time when I walked up to the Columbia football, you know, counter to do yeah. the first interview. Um, and the head coach had to actually say, welcome, welcome, gentlemen. And, and then he looked up and he had to say, ladies. That's well. awesome. Um, so I remember that time. And I wanted to ask you about your experience with 538 because uh -huh. you know they have a sports analytics specialty. Yeah. Um, it's really fascinating. I met the founder of 538. And he was yeah. fantastic at a Columbia Daily Spectator. Yeah. Oh, great. I just great. wanted to get your input on your time at 538 and how it influenced. Yeah, it was really interesting. I learned a lot. Um, I went there with a lot of field reporting experience and I spent a lot of time learning some of the data journalism work. And you should definitely, they have internships. Um, you should apply. I don't know if you have any interest. Uh, yeah, I graduated in December. Oh, you graduated? Oh, okay, no, okay. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I no, love well, thanks for coming. You already, you already graduated yeah. and you're still here. That's awesome. No, you sounded incredible. No, but that's, but yeah, but I do think that like, um, you know, and I also, and I'm forgetting her name, I'm sorry about this, there, I also recently got the chance to listen to a female executive at ESPN, mm -hmm. and she um, spoke to the 50 women um, program, the, the leadership program we had, and it was really interesting hearing her talk about being an executive at a sports channel. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are definitely some great women um, in sports journalism and I've gotten to meet a whole bunch over times like I met Robin Roberts when she was still a sports <laughs> journalist before she became you know just like an everything you know like soup to nuts host and and being a sports journalist really gave her the chance to show her skills and and her chops and and it, it can either be the lifetime pursuit for you or like her, you could be someone who like does sports for a certain number of years and then branches out into other things as well. But I'm really glad you're doing it. And, and I do think that, um, you know, I think the analytics part is great. And I, what I like the best is when people can blend some understanding of sports analytics with the kind of story behind a team. Like, you know, they did a lot of work on the Golden State Warriors that I liked because it was kind of like the story of why this team is great, both the analytics and the people. Mm -hmm. So I like stories like that. And then the great infographics. Yeah, like exactly. Yeah, 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 me too. Yeah. Me too. But congratulations. Are, are you working in journalism? Uh, right, right now I'm working at m and Bank. Uh -huh. They do the same reverse mentorship program. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's about. great. So, I yeah. Mean, um, sports marketing and, and commercial commercial bank marketing, but um, working. No, but that's fantastic. Yeah, working on the side to, to yeah. rekindle my love of sports journalism. Yeah. So I really appreciate it. And definitely, everyone's open to coming to Columbia Daily Spectator networking events as well for hmm. journalism. They have a lot of different events. So. Oh, that's yeah, fantastic. Great. Anyone wants the information? Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Yeah, and I hope that like if you feel like it, you still do some freelancing on the side, you know. Absolutely, yeah, I've really been considering it. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions?
Yeah. Hi, um, I'm a junior here, and mm -hmm. I take photos for Tech, um, and yeah, I'm also fantastic. interested in writing. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on journalism school, and if you think that foreign mm -hmm. students who are interested in being journalists should first like just see ways that we can get out there, or if we should look to go to grad school and kind of what you think. Because I just heard Nick. Yep. Answers to that. <laughs> Correct. Then, um, my other question would be advice you have for applying to these journalism internships and kind of like how to speak out. Yeah. So um, first of all, I, you should definitely read in the Columbia Journalism Review sometime within the past year. They had the, these set of essays. Should you go to journalism school? There was a yes, a no, and a maybe. And the one I related to the most was the maybe, because it was like someone who had literally racked up $80,000 in debt going to journalism school and was like, in retrospect, that was crazy. Um, I shouldn't have done it at that price point. But if you figure out the financing, it's you know, a good way to go. And the thing is, journalism schools cost all different sorts of money just the way that colleges do. Okay. So I would take a look also at the price points of different journalism schools. Also, they have different durations. There's you know, 18-month programs, two-year programs, some are one-year programs. So, just, so I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but I would look at some of these different assessments. Like I think going way too deep into debt for for a graduate degree in a profession that's financially unstable, probably not a great idea. So I would look at your debt load at, that you're gonna incur from going to journalism school. I never went to journalism school. I became an intern and then I actually interned for two years, which, by, which was frustrating because they're supposed to hire you at the six month mark or let you go, but <laughs> whatever. Um, you know, uh, and then I got a job there, and then I, you know, I kept hopping around, and and I learned almost, you know, pretty much everything I know on the job, which is also how I like to learn. Like I really enjoyed college when I was in college, and I loved having time to really go deep into things in classes. But I'm someone who also just really loves learning by doing, and learning on the job, and so that was a great path for me. Um, but I would just definitely try to stay out of that kind of crippling debt. Like, it's okay to have some debt, but to, to get into, and educational debt can't be discharged in a bankruptcy, which I know is like, that's probably the most fatalistic way of going to an end game, but the reality is, if you have medical debt and you need to file bankruptcy, you can. If you have all these other forms of debt, you can get rid of them. Educational debt can't be discharged. Now, I think that may eventually change, but it means that $80,000 or whatever is stuck to you forever, <laughs> forever, in a way that even other forms of debt aren't. So that's my caution there. But I think, um, you know, I think that you can probably find some good analyses, but in the end, it's really your choice because there's some, I found that the graduate students that I thought did the best were ones who had a specific passion. So they were like, I want to shoot a documentary while I'm at grad school, or I want to have the beginnings of a book proposal, or I want to do this big special thing. And they already had like some big goal that they were gunning for, but that's just my experience. And, and I definitely have a lot of students who I taught at NYU who've become total rock stars. Like there's this guy, <laughs> Jamiles Larte, who, covers um, inequality for the Guardian in the South, and he's just like, kind of, he can do anything, data journalism, field reporting. Um, he's just a really versatile reporter. He won NABJ, um, one of the excellence, you know, awards. And, you know, so, so I definitely have students who've been grad students of mine as well as other people I know who went to grad school where it was transformative for them. But I think it's really a cost-benefit analysis. And in terms of application, I would say that, you know, just at some point you probably will be asked to explain what your passion is for this field. And, and if you nail that, then I think that's probably the most important point. Other questions? So I'm just wondering if you know, 
Yeah. Right. Journalism media plays into that same idea. This person's either a representative or right. not. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any sentiments on that question about if all representation is meaningful and if we should look at someone as like a symbol of something or if there needs to be like greater discussions in journalism of maybe not. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. I think that it's more, it's more, it's less, for example, whether I think she's a symbol of something, um, but it's more about the sort of how closely do I, I feel the narrative in journalism is portraying the conversations accurately. Um, so, for example, there was that whole thing of like, did she listen to Snoop? Uh, you know, like, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, okay, like, are we really getting, are we boiling the black card down to, <laughs> did she listen, did she claim to listen to Snoop in college? And I think that that whole thread was just ridiculous. You know, it's like, it was clear that there was room for interpretation that she just was saying, I like Snoop and not, I listened to him in college. But, also that this would be the hill that somebody would die on like and judge her blackness based on how she answered this question i'm just like so it's to me it's more about looking at so for example barack obama was definitely a symbol he was a symbol of to many different things to many people including this idea that we were in a post-racial america right. ha, ha, ha. but um, <laughs> you know, it's like, but there were a lot of legitimate debates over what is he a symbol of and how much does he embrace, right. you know, because he definitely played with a lot of these, the symbolism in order to get elected. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more what I would really look for is how is Senator Harris depicting herself? When do people say that her narrative is one that should be challenged. Like the idea that she's being challenged on her narrative of blackness, let's put the Snoop thing aside. It's like, she's black, she went to an HBCU. To me, that's the end of the story. You know, like, I don't think she has to like carry her black card, like, you know? <laughs> and it's like, it's like, does the fact that she's black mean she should be president? No, but like, why are we gonna have like a million black card conversations about like, how many black people have one parent who's of a different race? A lot, you know, like, let's stop doing the black card thing. You know, like, you can say one person is an African American I would rather vote for than another person, but like, to question her blackness based on the fact that she has a South Asian mother is just BS to me. Right. Um, so I'm just interested in how these conversations circulate and what they say about the people writing the stories, mm. you know. But, but also I'm curious how she's going to frame herself. Like I think she spent a lot of time, I think that she probably understands that being a black candidate for president is a very mixed bag right now. Right. There's going to be some people who are very pro and some people who are very con. So I actually see her not doing a lot of messaging around it. She's probably waiting to see what she needs to rebut. Because, you know, despite the kerfuffle, I think that she is widely acknowledged to be the race that she claims, which is black, you know, like a black woman with a South Asian mother. But she's not, I don't think that that is gonna be widely disputed. The, what's gonna be disputed are the implications of it. Did her time as a prosecutor take her out of line with what African American communities needed? Like, there's much deeper conversations to be had. Whether or not we have them is up to us. <laughs> yes. I don't really, I have a very loose team, like I have an assistant, I have a consultant, 
I have a couple other people, but I still mainly have avoided managing on a large scale, which makes me happy. But I would say <laughs> that, you know, when I manage, and I have managed teams before, I, it's not that I've never done it, I am kind of a mentor manager. Like, I tend to really say, how can I help you be your best you? And also, you need to get all this other stuff done, too. But like, I'm really interested in you know, people's career development and helping them grow. And I have a lot of people I mentored who are in a bunch of different positions. So I really am focused on helping people achieve their goals and not just me achieve mine. Some of mine's comment. Yeah, yeah. You can comment Please. to my comment. Yeah. Of course, I, I might be the only white male in here. I think you are. Oh, no, there's two. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, I think that, um, of course, I think a train is a slow process. You know, yeah. all of it takes so long to change. It's been so long, you know, that way yeah. for so long. I think a lot of the way to get white male to change is the perception of, like, of course, I have a wife. Yeah. I have a daughter. And I think having a daughter, seeing her go through experiences, seeing her go through college, seeing yeah. her become highly educated, seeing her about to enter the workforce, all those things make you pull for that train. Yeah. To yeah. Change. Right. And having the having to educate yourself, maybe as a as a white male to say, what 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 I need to teach her or help her with as she enters the workforce. Yeah. You know, listening to the, the rhetoric and all those things, you have to educate yourself. So I listen to many podcasts, I read a lot of books, but she's starting to apply for jobs. She yeah. said, hey, you know, when you go into this, once you're offered that job, keep pulling for yourself. Yeah. You know, keep wanting a higher salary. I mean, signing bonus. I mean, there's so much that I think sometimes women yeah. stop. Yeah, women no, say, you're right. I'm happy to have the job. Where a man You're will very say, right. I'm, I want more. Give me more. And yeah. I think sometimes that's maybe, I don't think that's a bad thing, but I think it, where women fall short, if you will. And I think another thing that affects that in the workforce is there's some cattiness that happens a lot with women fighting amongst women. Mm -hmm. And, they, you know, of course yeah. they march and say Me Too movement, but then once they're in the workforce together, they beat each other down, if you will. And I don't feel that necessarily from a male perspective where you're trying to step on someone else to get where you're going. And I sense that sometimes with women in the workforce. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, you know, I think it's complicated. So my, my worst bosses have been women. I'll be real about that. Um, not, and some of my best bosses too. But I would say my two worst bosses were both women. And I think sometimes there is a... Um, there. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, I think there are women who believe like there's, you know, it's like there can be only one and it's going to be me. But I also think that there are a lot more women who really play well for equity overall, not just for women, but for everyone to do better. And I think that, I think that a lot of the, you know, sort of cattiness type thing is about this idea, because first of all, I've worked at a lot of places where there's no cattiness whatsoever. So I think that that is, that can be overstated, but I think that when there is that element of woman on woman negative competition, it usually comes, as you said, out of a position of scarcity, this idea that there can only be so much for the women, so I'm gonna get the, the big share of that. But what you're saying, it, also about like women not negotiating is correct, there's also a bit of a caveat. So in the book I write about how women just don't negotiate in general, period, <laughs> you know, like on salary and on other things. And women definitely don't negotiate as hard as men, but also there's a very specific thing that happens when women try to negotiate, which is often they're seen as ungrateful. Like I'm giving you this opportunity, you're ungrateful. So there's a way around that where women have to say for the good of the team. Like I always tell people, like when I found this research, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so true. But it's like if you say for the good of the team, you know, it's like I, you know, like so if a man gets a job offer, account like he's working someplace already, he gets an offer from a competitor. He walks in, he says, match it or I go. That's fine. It, they may match it, they may not, but you know, he's got a plan. 
when women walk in, there have been cases where women were fired basically for trying to negotiate off of an outside offer because they were viewed as ungrateful. And so you constantly have to say, for the good of the team, I'd like to remain for our stability and you raising my salary to this point will allow me to stay and you won't have to train anyone new. But like you have to explain, men can basically walk in with a rock star proposition like, I'm a rock star, give me this money. And they'll be judged in one way, but when a woman says, I'm a rock star, give me the money, like, what? You're a rock star? So I think it's more complicated both on the cattiness side and on the non-negotiation because if women are used to getting negative reactions when they negotiate, it makes it a lot harder to come up with the courage to negotiate. But it's definitely still worth it. But it, you have to understand kind of way, the way things work and that you always have to make, you just can't go in for the most part with your rock star self, even if you are a rock star because of perceptions of women somehow having to be eternally grateful right. all the time for everything right you know and and you can either walk in and say i've got this counter offer and i'm not grateful about this and give me my money or you can play the game and be like it's just so wonderful i appreciate everything you've done and for the good of the team you need to raise my salary or i'll go right. you know? <laughs> it might feel that way though if the female was in charge and the man was coming to her he might have to have a different perspective too than I'm a rock star. Yeah, I don't know though. I it don't know. Women are socialized to, to kind of play play the play the same game. Mm -hmm. So, but I think those are excellent points. I think we have time for one last question. Yeah. yeah. So I've also been interested in journalism forever. Oh, that's um, great. Now I'm in the midst of applying for internships for the summer. Um, oh yeah. And journalism itself is such a broad industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just wondering, as a college student, kind of starting out with my career, how versatile do I need to be? What range of skills would I need? Um, and what skills do you think are the most important to have to start out? Well, I mean, I think that the, the main skills that you need are obviously some sense of the language you're working in. And so that could mean a language could be English, a language could be Spanish, but a language could be computer coding, if you want to be um, a, a data science driven journalist, the language could be photography and visual language. So you have to have some fluency in the language that you're choosing to work in, whether it's video, photo, computer, or text. But, but it's, I think the main thing is just really having a sense of curiosity and exploration, like going in and saying, you know, I'm here to learn, I'm here to absorb, I'm here to like innovate with you and don't be afraid of um, you know positioning yourself like I think that also I don't even know if you're considered Millennials now what is what like, are you still Millennials and Gen Z uh, Gen Z, Gen Z. Gen Z. Gen Z. Yeah. yeah I like it I like it I, I try that too so somehow it doesn't work um, but yeah but you know, it's like I have a friend who manages a lot of millennials at a big media company and she and they love her because she's the person who will give them all sorts of opportunities but also say, respectfully, I don't think you can be running this unit right now. You're like six months into your job and I know you think you can. So there's also like a, 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 a bit of a tension around you want to position yourself as a go-getter but also someone who is willing to learn and collaborate mm -hmm. and who doesn't go in and just sets terms like, I want to be doing this in this amount of time, you know, and it's, and it's a negotiation because there is a bad rap that I think millennials and younger workers get, which is often, I think, false and a miscommunication, but you have to be aware that that stereotype is out mm -hmm. there. So how do you position yourself as someone who is a go-getter and innovative, but also willing to listen and collaborate? So that's part of it. You know, so maybe in your internships, inter internship applications, talk about a time where someone gave you feedback that was hard to take, but what you learned from it mm -hmm. in a positive way. Like that could be an interesting part of your essay or your presentation. Yeah, sure. All right, well, I just want to thank everybody again for coming. Can we have a round thank of applause? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.